Welcome, welcome. This is Rodney Perry of the Simply King Podcast. And as you see from the title of this episode and the description of this episode, we are talking about some heavy, heavy things dealing with, you know, abuse and how to, you know, progress through that trauma. It speak, we, we speak about familial abuse. We speak about domestic abuse. We speak about a lot of different things. So certainly, certainly want to give you all who are listening a soft trigger warning. It was a healthy conversation. Um, I enjoyed it. I believe Shari is certainly a, a resource and a person who's a professional. So I feel like she handled it very well. So hope you enjoy, but just definitely want to let you know to proceed with caution. If it's not the time to listen to this, please just come back to it later or come back or, or share it to somebody you know who might need the uh, the information. Appreciate you in advance. Peace. Welcome, welcome. This is the Simply King Podcast. This is your boy Rodney Perry King himself. And you just tune into the Soulfully Conscious Podcast for humans, simply being humans. And we are in a new year. It is 2024. And I'm so glad to be able to continuously. I'm coming into, I think it's going to be nine years this year in September. And um, it's great to be able to continuously connect with really great people. My guest for today is a clinician, an author, uh, and, and so many other things. And I'm so glad that she gave me her time today. Let me introduce to you all Shari Bodwin. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm glad you gave me some of your time. Very happy to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so so let's get right into it. I would love for people to get to get familiar with who you are and your work as a whole. First, let's start at the beginning. Where are you from? And what led you to what you currently do? So I am from the South Jersey area. That's where I grew up. And then I moved out to the suburbs of PA in my early 20s. Um, I, I grew up in a very abusive home. I'm a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. So starting around the age of 10, when I started to realize that my life was not normal and that I had all these awful feelings and I felt stranded. I decided at that age that I wanted to do something that was going to be about helping other people and getting more support for myself. So I don't think I knew as a kid that I was going to become a therapist, but I knew I was going to do something where I was going to have the opportunity to work with, whether it was children or teenagers or families so when I, when I went to college, I majored in psychology, of course, mm -hmm. and um, graduated with my bachelor's, sort of spent a year trying to figure out what, what am I doing, who am I, um, got away from my family, got a place to live, found, found safety for myself, and then I went for my master's in social work. So I did that at Rutgers, um, graduated from there. And started working in a place that dealt mostly with eating disorders. It's called the Renfrew Center. So I worked there for almost two years. And what I started to realize when I worked at the Renfrew Center was that most of the women checking in for bulimia, anorexia, binge eating disorder also had a pretty horrific childhood trauma history. Mm. Um, and that's when I sort of dove into my own work and realized that I was one of them and needed to get help. So I spent about 10 mm. years in very intensive therapy. And as I was doing that, I opened my own practice because I needed space and I needed, I needed to feel safe in the work that I was doing. So at that point, my practice was mostly um, women and teenagers who were st struggling with eating disorders. And then as I, was in my practice longer and longer because I've been there. I can't believe I'm saying this, but uh, 27 years. Um, <laughs> I only feel 27 years old. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how that's possible, but um, <laughs> after I after I was in the practice for maybe 10, 15 years at the most, my whole practice started to shift into people were coming to me because they had been in situations where they were abused, mm -hmm. um, domestic violence, mm -hmm. a lot of, lot of adults were coming to me saying that they had a history yeah. from childhood. So for the last, I would say, cause I've been there 27 years for at least like the last 12 years, 
I've been working mostly with adult survivors of different types of childhood trauma, abuse, um, loss in families, house fires, gun violence. Mm. So that's been sort of what I've been doing. Well, it is what I've been doing. And um, I started writing and doing more media interviews um, and went public with my own story of abuse after I attended both of the Cosby trials, which were in 2017 and 2018. Mm. So my career in the last seven years has, it's kind of shifted because now I'm doing like four other things in addition to seeing clients. Yeah. And w- would you say, cause I think that it's really interesting. Thank you for giving, you know, always, I, I said this to you when I first uh, spoke to you, it's, it's always a lot in my mind of like being able, but it's also inspirational at the same time to see you be able to reflect and to regurgitate your story and for you to do it in a very graceful way. You know, it really shows how much you've, process so much of your own trauma, how much you've like gotten, you know, to a new level and to a new step. And the work is the work. Like you really, you can really sense that the work has been done to get yourself to a certain place. One thing that I would like to point out though, cause um, I think you said, you definitely said a lot that I think we'll unpack in this conversation, but um, do you believe, or have you ever thought about your kind of, you know, being attracted to psychology and being attracted to the idea of helping people was a somewhat of a self projection of what you wanted to do for yourself in a way, because, because you ultimately ended up kind of getting to that road anyway, even in the process of, you know, you are going after your education and your, you know, specific specialties, the fact that you got to a point to where it's like, I'm about to help all these people and I need to, I need some help. Hold on. <laughs> well, do you think that in, 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 you know, in hindsight, that was you longing for, you know, to, to try to solve and heal yourself? Or do you, have you even thought about it that way? I think it's, no, it's a great question. And I think it's both. Mm. Um, so right now I'm serving as what's called an expert witness in mm-hmm. a case with dozens of plaintiffs who were abused by their pediatrician as children. And in the hearing yesterday, Oof. in the hearing yesterday, this woman, I she was amazing. She talked in the hearing about how, When she got to be around the same age that I was, when Mm -hmm. I got my master's, she got her master's in social work Mm -hmm. and she spent nine years working in a rape crisis center. And one of the things that she talked about in the hearing, and then I commented on this when I gave my testimony was she realized later in life, like now she's in her forties, that part of the reason why she wanted to work Mm -hmm. in a place like that is because she was trying to figure out what happened to her. She was trying to figure out how it affected her mm-hmm. and and how to heal from it. So I agree a hundred percent that part of my drive, like when I started working at that eating disorder center, yeah. I was like, Oh my gosh, everything these women are saying are things that either I feel or I have felt mm. um, or I struggle with. So probably six months into my start at that job, I finally got a therapist because I knew uh, if I want to work here and if I want to work in this field, I better figure this out. Yeah, I would have, I used to come home from work and just sit in my chair and stare at the wall for hours because I was so depressed. I was so overwhelmed and I didn't really understand why, because I was so detached from my childhood abuse. And when this woman testified yesterday, she said the same thing. Mm. It's almost like you feel like it was somebody else, but then you sit and talk to people and I would be like, Oh my gosh, everything that these people are saying. Yes. uh Uh-huh. Oh no. I think I I felt the same way and I had to face it. So I believe on some level I went into the field because I needed to figure out what in the world happened to me. I completely blocked my trauma. My abuse occurred in the nighttime when I was asleep. I dissociated. I just sort of, you know, I can't give you a clear idea of how I did it because I was so young when it started, Mm -hmm. but I just left my body. So whatever my dad was doing to me, I didn't remember. I didn't remember the next day. I, I would feel things the next day and I had awful shame and, um, you know, I hated myself, but I didn't, I had no idea why. 
I mean, so, it, it's it's incomprehensible for a child. So I understand. I can only imagine the level of trauma that you know so many so many you know survivors have went through, and that's in that regard. And I think um, yeah. I think it's interesting that you know no matter how how often you know we hear particular stories as such, it's still something that we all have to you know grasp and really fathom. And I think it's uh cra- It's always like crazy to me to imagine that you know people still are um trying to dispel belief that it can happen or it has happened to various people you know a very you know I know in the work that you've done from a from a cultural context I can only imagine that you know you've noticed those how each groups and each you know ethnic group kind of you know responds to these things and I think the similarity that I think has been shown via popular culture is that there is this, you know, indirect and, you know, very mute shame that the family kind of keeps, keeps, you know, keeps under wraps. Like they maybe know that this has happened or have suspicion that something is going on, but nobody really wants to unearth or help the, you know, the survivors of these scenarios. So it's, it's always really interesting to me that it, when it, but when it happens to people that are quote unquote, the, I guess the best suspects or spokespeople for this type of abuse, then it's like, oh yeah, it's easy. When it's just a random guy on Channel 5 News that looks very, you know, trouble. <laughs> oh yeah, I can believe that he did something to somebody. But when it's somebody who's this upstanding individual, a father, an uncle, a, a mother, whomever it might be, a brother, whoever it might be, that's when it's kind of like, mm, are we sure that that's a thing? And that, can you speak to that? Is there something that you, you know, kind of, you know, came across in your work as to why that's the reaction, at least from a psychological context, why that's the reaction from so many people who aren't even the ones going through the trauma directly? I think you I think you basically already said it. I don't think people can tolerate or accept that somebody in good standing or somebody who is uh, in a role such as like a pediatrician Mm -hmm. or a priest or a coach, um, a teacher. I think people can't fathom how would an adult who's also supposed to be in a child's life in a way that's about trust and safety and mentoring and educating, how does an adult do that to a kid or a teenager? Mm -hmm. And I think even with all the, all the work that I've done, all the therapy that I've done, all the um, hearings I've completed for this particular case that I'm working on, yeah. it comes up every single time I'm in the hearing. It comes up all the time when I'm working where half of the therapy really is about accepting that something that seems impossible to it's happen. Like it's just, it's something that I think survivors and the public will struggle with. I just think that as humans, we can't fathom how somebody could commit such awful acts, Mm -hmm. especially when it's on to children. But even if it's just, uh, you know, a man to a woman or a woman to a man, I just, I think people don't want to, they just don't want to accept that there's such evil or the way I would say it is illness Mm -hmm. in people because the people who are committing these types of crimes are sick individuals they are so sick Uh, and I have a better way of understanding that part because of my training and I understand pathology behind pedophiles predators I don't think it's okay but I understand it when I went to the Cosby trial and I sat in there um, and I watched him in court nobody saw that you know the the public wasn't in the courtroom so Mm -hmm. only you get like you know like little pieces of information I could see his demeanor and how he reminded me a lot of my father, the way he acted when the women testified, Mm. when the lawyers were confronting him, just so aloof and uh, just arrogant in the way that he sat there. And like, why would you say that I did these things? And I believe that sick people can make themselves believe that that they, they didn't do anything. This doctor that I'm currently working on in this case, he has taken not one, not no ownership. And there's over 80 women who filed lawsuits against him. Oh my God. And he has not responded to any of them. None. I I, I think, you know, to, 
keep, you know, to stay in that same space. I think that um, it's something that I, I remember. I, it was a uh, filmmaker that I actually, a documentarian that I met in my senior year at college, um, had a lot of, you know, I feel like I had a lot of creative friends and uh, my best friend was just kind of trying to find mentorship and uh, trying to find, you know, re- people to shadow. And he came across this, this filmmaker, this gentleman who was kind of a part of this team of, you know, of creatives. And um, I went over, you know, took him over to his house and we all kind of just, you know, kicked it and had, you know, had, 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 you know, it was kind of like a quick little party, a small little dinner party. And uh, I was asking him like, you know, it's just dope to hear, you know, the work that you have done, what are you working on now? And he gives me the story of, he was like, you honestly would be surprised right now what I'm working on. And he was like, I'm doing a documentary um, investigating essentially the pathology of pedophiles specifically. And, and we were like, so what is, I was like, so how, like, how, how is that going? Like, like, give us whatever you can give us. We would love to understand, you know, Mm -hmm. the driving force behind these producers who are producing this thing and all these various things. What have you, you know, discovered from this? And he says that uh, there's been kind of like a split house And, and in context to what he's noticed. He said that there were certain men who were, who got to a point of awareness where they kind of surrendered to the idea of them not understanding why they are the way they are. Mm-hmm. And, and, and also starting to accept the, the, the negative morality that that is like, this is, I am on the wrong side of this and I don't, but I don't know why this is what I want to do. This is what I did. This is wh- how I have to live my life moving forward. And I have to, contend with this for the rest of my life. I'm on a, I'm on a, I'm on a sex offenders list. I'm on these things. Like I've served time, but I do know that I was wrong, but I also know that I didn't, I didn't, I, I, I genuinely don't, didn't think of it any other way other than this is something that I desire. And, and at that time I, I did whatever I could do to, to, you know, to get to that point. And then the other side were people who were in the, the deepest sense of their delusion, self delusion of like them even being able to do something that was incorrect. Even though that the, the, the you know, the, the evidence and the amount of evidence, as you see in, you know, in this case with this pediatrician and with uh, with Bill Cosby, it's like it's kind of evident that you did something. It's very evident that you were harming people in some way, shape or form. And um, the abuse being something that's very much there because it was a pattern of things like there were certain things that are that all these stories have in common. And it's like these things can't be all just, you know. Un- uncomfortable nights or nights where, you know, you just didn't read the room correctly. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's something that I think a lot of men don't really understand in today. And, um, but, but, but I think we'll talk about that more later. I do want to, you know, pivot back to um, the survivor's perspective um, because you work with, you've, you've worked with so for so long with so many different people and you've also done the work with yourself. So I would love, you know, your personal opinion as well as your professional one. Um, and you've worked with so many women of various different ethnicities as well. Have you noticed any particular trends um, in the, I don't even know how to put this, in the, in, 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 when you notice how they heal after these traumatic scenarios, is there any like similarities and contrast or when it comes to things that are, as I guess, for lack of a better phrase, you know, it's universal, anybody can go through trauma. It, it, do we all respond to it in the same way or is there a, is there any subtle differences? Everybody's different. Mm-hmm. You know, the question, the answer is in some ways people respond very similarly, but yet every single person that I have met has the, a unique way of handling it. And I think it's partly because of their histories or their backgrounds mm. where, you know, their ethnicities. I also work with men. So I've worked with obviously more women than men, but I have worked with men who are also survivors Mm. and I notice differences between men and women. I notice differences culturally between different backgrounds. I would say the thing that's pretty universal is that most people who have some type of trauma in their history will feel somehow like they are the cause of it. And they feel enormous amounts of shame and self blame that is unearned and not, something they should have to feel that's something that i noticed the other thing that's very common with people no matter what their backgrounds are is 
when when somebody has dealt with a trauma, especially in childhood, and they haven't figured out how to deal with it, many of the people I have worked with have had a history of eating disorders, drug addiction, alcohol abuse. So that's another common trend is that what people do when they don't want to know what happened to them or they don't want to talk about it or they don't want to think about it is they find ways to push it away. Mm -hmm. They find ways to numb. I was talking to another person that I'm working on a case with and she, her way of not dealing with her trauma, she just works all the time. Mm -hmm. She works 16 hours a week, seven day, 16 hours a day, six to seven days a week. Mm -hmm. And that, that feels like a common, that definitely feels like a common thing for a lot of people too, is to, um, to do that. I, I've, I've drawn out and pointed out to a lot of friends of mine pointing out the, uh, the phenomenon of like a young man and his, you know, twenties or, you know, his, throughout his college years and throughout his twenties being quote unquote, the idea of, you know, men, young men are always, you know, promiscuous. Right. And when I came into knowledge of the way that promiscuity is also a, um, a behavior of depression, it blew my mind. Like it blew my mind because I think that, you know, just like what you're saying, the usual vices are, you know, drugs, alcohol, you know, and possibly self-harm in some way, shape or form because they, they either people want to feel something or they don't want to, they want to, you know, really, you know, detract themselves from what it is that's really going on. But sex specifically as a, as a vice or as this way to have some type of way for someone else to soothe you and get your mind off this thing also is a thing too. And I think that usually it's always, you know, pointed out and shamed when it comes to women. But I think no one really ever, I think rarely ever do I hear people speak from it from a context of why men show up this way and how it's been if at this point kind of grown into this acceptance of just overall generalized normal behavior. Oh yeah, he's, he's, he's a boy. So yeah, of course he wants to, you know, he's his hormones and all these things. So, yes, of course, he's going to be out in the streets doing all of what he's doing and always just just chasing skirts. But the reality of it is probably a large portion of these young men probably are going through something and just trying to find a way to keep their minds off of what it is that they can. They, they can be speaking to and expressing and working on. And, and I don't know if you've noticed those things, but it, I think that it's it is interesting how and I think that that's why the progression of fixing these things and studying these things in a certain way haven't happened because it's like because, quote unquote, men aren't aren't the the biggest victims and the biggest survivors of these particular, you know, traumatic situations. It's like the there's 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 not too much research. There's not too much resources, you know, because it's like, oh, yeah, it's just boys will be boys. And there's a few there's an occasion where there's some bad boys doing too much is the kind of thing, but the idea, but the, the root, the, before we even get to it being something harmful, the fact that we're making space for the, like the hypersexuality of it all is creating a space for harm to occur. Yes, absolutely. And, and I, I do wonder, like, do you believe that if there is, and it feels almost oddly counterintuitive to me, if there is this odd kind of focusing in on and unwrapping and unpacking these things with men that it will, I don't know if it would help everyone, oh. but I feel like if that happens, that will then highlight like that, that would just, just blow it up into a whole new and a whole new stratosphere. Cause now they're realizing, Oh, but it's been happening with women this whole time. And now that it's now that we're unearthing that it's happening to men or men are finding ways to, you know, have all these different things. Now we can do more about it. Do you think that that's what, can occur or you think that's oh, what might might be yeah. the thing that creates a better shift in resources? I think it would be great if we could focus on, in on that and help the public or even the people that are in the situation better understand mm -hmm. what, what the role of sex is in their lives and the purpose that it serves. That's sort of like the core of my work. When somebody has a self-destructive or even impulsive way of masking feelings one of my goals is to help people understand so tell me more about what what the purpose that it serves is it is it comforting is it your it does it become like your best friend is it a way for you to to not feel once we can figure out what we're doing no matter what the vice is sex drugs gambling 
then we can make other choices. So mm-hmm. sex is just one other way. Yeah. And I think like you're saying, it's not very much talked about, especially with men, how men also, because men are human too, right? Men will do things or have different strategies to try to not be in as much pain. Yeah. And that is one of the things that men do. And I've, I've worked with women who also will, because of their abuse, they become very promiscuous mm-hmm. in like their early adulthood, late, late adolescence. It's very, it's, it's very common. And I think it's important not just to say, well, that's a warning sign for her. It's a warning sign for him too. Yeah. And, 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 and I think that it may not. And I think the weird or strange part about it to me from a, from an observation context is like, we don't know if anything has genuinely happened to this, right. to this, to this young man, if they show up this way. And I think that what makes it very insidious is that there is this uh, invisible pressure to show up that way. I remember being, uh, I remember being in middle school. I remember being in middle school. I'm talking about, I'm 13 years oh. old. I'm a child and feeling like I got to have sex before I go to high school. Oh. I was like, it has to happen. I'm, I'm, I, I'm going to be seen in a way if I, if I really don't know what I'm doing or don't know what I'm talking about. I, I cared about it way more than I ever needed to. And I, and I reflect back on that anytime I have conversations with friends anytime we talk about, you know, either what what it was like being, you know, that age and what was going on and what was happening and to not be able to speak from it from just an innocent place always like unsettles me a little bit, you know, because it's like I, I made those choices actively because I was motivated by the idea of like fitting in. And, and it's crazy about fitting in about something that's intimate to you. Right. You know, it's like you do something privately so that in the event that it, it's a question or it comes up in conversation or there's an assumption made, you can, quote unquote, speak from first person experience. And that's really all it was being able to stand my, quote unquote, stand in my masculinity and be able to say in the locker room or in, you know, in these circles. Oh, no, I, 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 I did something, you know, da, da, da. and I'm 13, I'm 14 years old caring about this this much. And I, and like I reflect back on that all the time, like it none of it matter. And then I put myself through all of this unnecessary stress, trying to sneak, trying to do all these things, you know, and, and, and communicating in these ways in which that people might have felt uncomfortable. I, I was uncomfortable, but I like just convinced myself like this is how it's supposed to be, you know, regardless of what was going on. And also the focus, like I can only imagine if I focused in <laughs> on what I had space to focus in on, like school work and various things. I did pretty, did pretty decently. I graduated with a pretty decent GPA, but the fact that I still allow so much space for those things too, I can only imagine if I allow for my innocence to like, you know, be maintained and then, and just genuinely wait, <laughs> like genuinely just wait because the biggest reveal for me, Shari was so many girls didn't care. <laughs> so many of them weren't doing it at all. Were either afraid or did or just were very fine with the idea of waiting until they were adults. And so many of them was like, if they would, if, if a guy would have told me that, I would have still dated him. I would have still, we still would have been friends. All those things would have happened. And I'm like, dang, like I'm over here putting all this pressure on myself for nothing, you know. But it, it, it you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. But I, I genuinely believe that that's. The issue, too, is that you have this hypersexuality with it that's attached to masculinity that's that's almost expected and accepted. But also, too, there is, you know, there are obviously are those examples of people who have who have been harmed and traumatized in some way, shape or form. And that's why they show up the way they do. But I think that the part that doesn't make sense to me is how we how we haven't gotten to these particular connections. I feel like there's been so much research and so many things out there that to me should have created a shift in how we approach these lessons and, and how people are rearing their children and how people are creating um, different, you know, methods of self-esteem, you know, for, for their, in their households. But, you know, that's my little antidote. <laughs> that's my little antidote. But I, I genuinely, I genuinely feel that way. And I don't know... If you see, if you, if you, I would love to know if you see ways in which that would be solutions that start at a place, at a space like, you know, like high school, like middle school, where so many of these things, you know, usually occur, you know? I mean, 
Yeah. I think having conversations with our little guys, my, my kid is about to turn 13. I wish he were here right now listening to this. I think having an open dialogue, <laughs> you're like, oh my gosh, get me out of here. But I think having like an open dialogue and letting kids know, like using your story as an example, that would be so great. If you could sit in a classroom with 50, 12, 13, 14 year olds and say, listen, here's the deal. And to be able to tell them, uh, you know, you may feel like this now, but let me tell you why you may not want to act on that feeling. I think that's the most important thing, just to be able to have these conversations and to be open about what kids are, or what boys are expecting of themselves, what their peers expect of them, what they're watching on social media, what, you know, what are the kids that make these videos? What messages are you getting from them? That's what I think makes the difference. Yeah. I, and I always wondered that because I've been real big on that being a part of the solution um, is kind of, you know, it's crazy because they're trying to take away things out of <laughs> out of school books and out of schools these days. But that, that's a whole nother podcast. In my mind, I always think about the amount of time that I spent in school. And like the amount of time I spent in school that could have been utilized for me to really genuinely have these like small steps, these incremental steps of understanding what the real world was going to be like. Like you have to go through, you know, 13 years of primary school and in each year they always are regurgitating. In most of those years, they're regurgitating very similar topics, social studies, reading, math, you know, and science. And we're getting the same thing, which we're just unraveling, we're just peeling back the onion a little bit more every year. And I think that to me, adding in, you know, emotional and, you know, emotional learning into those things, adding in, you know, I believe a lot of, I remember like sex education um, in middle school, but it was like very, it, it's always been a joke where it's like, nobody really wants to talk about it. Yeah. Parents don't really want to talk about it. And when it comes to the school, they show you a tape, they give you a, they give, give you some, some diagrams, tell you about this, tell you about that. They split you up most of the time. They're not, it's not even happening in the same room. They usually have, you know, one instructor with the, with the girls and another instructor with the boys. Uh, but like we live in an age now where a lot of those conversations should happen in front of all of us. Young boys are growing up really not understanding women and their bodies and, and various things. And they need to understand those things if they, quote unquote, claim to want to have, you know, intimate partnership one day as, as adults. But also just in, from a context of just understanding the human experience as a whole, like everybody should understand what everybody is going through and how the how 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 the human like just interaction of, you know, sex and various things work. Um, and, and, and what could possibly occur, you know, and it could be filled with so many things around health and so many things. And I think that the fact that there is this real like Puritan approach <laughs> of like purity and piety of like, no, these children just need to be virgins. And the least they know about sex, sexuality, gender and all these various things, the better. But ultimately, it doesn't stop anything. You know, like it's still like people who don't feel like they were assigned the right gender are going to feel like that anyway. The people who feel so out of their body are going to feel like that anyway. People who feel like they're being forced to be attracted to a certain gender are going to feel like that anyway. You know, and, and it's it's like you can't really stop it. So in my mind, being forward about it is the best way to kind of just cover your bases. And at least everybody's starting from a place that's the same foundation of being knowledgeable of these things, you know, but I, I think the, the hardest part, though, and you can tell me what you think about it, if this is something that could be actually like, I don't know, given to the children in some way, shape or form is an education on like healing and trauma, because we don't know, you know, like we, we have things like, you know, the DA, you know, uh, what was it, the DHS and I think all those different things where, you know, there's hotlines and various things where that, that can possibly assist children um, get aid and, or support in some way, shape, or form if they're in a bad situation. But I always wonder if, if that's too much to like have, you know, some type of facilitator instruct children on these really, really, you know, traumatic things that might occur because there's no telling if that could even be approved. Like, has this happened to you if you have experience? Like, I don't know if that makes sense, uh, but what do you think would be the best way to even approach that? Because I think that that matters too. 
I mean, I think just because I have a kid who's in school now, I can see that there is a little bit more, at least where I live, a little bit more attention and education around what are some things that you need to watch out for? What are ways Mm. that you can get help? Um, I think when I was growing up, I didn't even know what to call what was happening to me. Now I notice kids will say things like, um, they'll say like a child abuse or what did my kid say? He said, I'm going to, we were messing around. He says, I'm going to report you to the, to the something, something, something. And I was just like, Hey, listen, where did you learn that? (laughs) Actual heck. And I was actually glad because I'm like, well, I'm glad that he knows most likely he saw it on TikTok or Probably. something. Yeah. But I think I think there's still a lot more that needs to be done. I think when the kids are learning about, you know, sex and how their bodies work, there is some education about what are eating disorders, what's sexual assault, what's date rape. Some of that is in there. Is it in there enough and in a way that makes sense to these kids? Probably not. Because again, these are conversations you can't just sort of say today we're going to focus on date rape and then you know yeah like, yeah i get that this is something that like is very sensitive and probably needs a, a like you said like a whole course in and of itself yeah i don't think there's any school that i've heard of that actually has a whole course on these topics but i think that there we are a society that is trying to work on having more education and more conversations some of it depends where you live too. Yeah. I, live in, I live in PA. So I would say it's more liberal than maybe if we lived somewhere in the South. Yeah. Or, man, like in Georgia, I'm in Georgia. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of things under the Bible, but and I, cause I grew up in Tennessee. So that's why, that's why I speak to that as a, as a, as a situation where it's like, you don't know what you, what you haven't seen. So you don't even know what your options are if no one told you what your options are. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, that's kind of what I think about. It's like, I understand the, and I, and I'm, and I'm certainly a little bit more, I'm more, I'm a little bit more on the cynical side of thinking about society and life, even though I could have a really good, happy disposition. So to me, it's like, tell the truth to the kids. (laughs) Like the kids should know their history. They should know how the, how the, how, how America was built, what is happening in the world and what's happening in the world. Cause I, I rather than be knowledgeable, and instead of them be given this role, these role color lenses and, and be disappointed by the life that they come into, because that's what I feel like so much of rearing, you know, children throughout the years is it's like trying to protect them from so many things. Then they become adults and then they're shocked. And it's a major culture shock of like, whoa, whoa. And it's not just bills. It's like, hold on. So that's what's going on. Is somebody not about to do something about this? Hold on. I'm paying for that. Like that's that's my my tax dollars are doing this thing or are, are making it so that this can happen. So to me, I definitely believe there could be um, definitely, you know, softer language, I guess, that could be introduced into these things to present them um, to uh, to a group of children that where it's likely where it could possibly start to happen to them um, because of their, you know, their, their independence starting. You know, like I think, you know, prior to middle school, you're not staying after school as much, you know, you're going home. You're, you're being super heavily supervised from adult, from one adult to another. You're, you're in line going from class to class. You, they're making sure you get on the bus. They make sure you get in your car, all those things. There's so many parameters in place now to make sure that children under, you know, sixth grade certainly are, you know, exactly where they need to be. But Mm -hmm. then sixth grade comes. Now it's like, oh, you can walk home from school if you if you live a certain distance. We need to know that, though. But you can walk home from school. You can, you know, have lunch outside. You can do all these things. And then it gets it gets even more and deeper and deeper into some sense of independence. By the time you're in high school, you can leave campus for lunch. (laughs) You can do this. You can do that. And like so many schools are like allowing and I understand those spaces being being there for a sense of development for the children. But I also don't understand it from a context of, all right, if we're going to do this, but we're not going to tell them about what can happen when they go out in the world, that's putting them in harm's way because they might be going on an innocent run to Chipotle, you know, when they're sophomores or juniors in high school and have a whole interaction with an adult where there's no other adults that are going to, that they don't, they can't depend on coming to their aid. And they don't, and they might not, and they might be so shocked by that interaction. They're not even taking 
notes of things. They're not even prepared to deal with this situation by way of like immediately calling someone or all these things. Sometimes they just shocked and petrified in the moment because it, this you listen to adults, you obey adults orders. So if there's an adult out in public harassing children, mm-hmm. you might, they might not know what to do. Right. And they might not, like they might be so shocked by it. It's like he had a beard. I don't know. We don't have any other descriptors. So now you just have this person who's going around, you know, harassing high school girls, high school boys, high school people. And and now here we are. And I feel like it has to be something put in place so that that so that children are genuinely prepared, because I think for a lot of people, a lot of those conversations genuinely don't start until you get to college. And that right. still depends on the type of college you go to. Yep. Because I went to a private I went to a private institution and it was not only a private institution, it was an HBCU, too. So there were definitely certain things that they used to go really deep on mm-hmm. culture and, you know, black history and all these various things. But when it came to things such as, you know, you know, the the the, the sex crimes and various things like that, that, ha- that are so pervasive in college spaces, it's always very like, mm, I just, you know, don't, ah, you know, it's real, it's real tight. You know, people get real tight about that. And I, I think that something can happen. I just feel like something can happen. Um, slight pivot. I wanted to, you know, get into, and, and because you've worked so heavily with these very high, you've been witness to these very high profile, um, cases as well as, you know, just being a, you know, a person within, I can only imagine you having the expertise you have and also witnessing all these very popular cultural things happen. The idea around, um, the Me Too movement was something that truly shook up the whole world. And I believe I believe what kind of, you know, struck it was um, several different, you know, executives or specific men in high places being accused kind of in a simultaneous time. Um, so I believe, the, you know, the, the kind of, you know, the biggest needle in the um, uh, that broke the camel's back was uh, Harvey Weinstein, for sure. Um, but even then, I think that there's something to be said about it. What did you feel when you noticed? I think that's my first question. What did you feel when you noticed that the Me Too movement was having this interesting resurgence when it, you know, it was already it's something that was already, you know, established, but it seemed like it had this new, this rebrand all of a sudden by so many different celebrity uh, public figures. What'd you feel about that when that started to occur? I mean, at the time, I remember feeling incredibly hopeful and empowered. Mm-hmm. The one thing that I, I remember struggling with soon after, once I realized, you know, who was coming forward and the focus of the conversations, I did feel like there was, um, you know, the whole idea of children who were abused. I felt like that was not acknowledged. Hashtag me too, to me is more about people who've been, whether it's trafficked or sexually assaulted by these prominent figures. Um, Most of these cases were either late, like late adolescence or early adulthood. So I found myself over time getting frustrated with the focus only being or mostly being on a particular type of abuse versus what about all the other people out here who weren't abused by Harvey Weinstein or Bill Cosby or uh, Larry Nasser, all these people. Like then I started getting frustrated and, and a lot of survivors were talking to me about how they felt like in some ways, hashtag me too was more silencing because then you feel like, well, I wasn't a, I wasn't assaulted by Harvey Weinstein. Mm. I was assaulted by my my dad or the teacher. And these are not high profile cases. So the idea of it was amazing. And I still think it's amazing, but there were parts of it that are that I feel are also problematic. Mm-hmm. And it's nobody's fault. It's not, you know, nobody did anything. I just think that there's so much attention on these specific individuals that many other survivors who had regular you know, people in their lives causing such harm, they're not getting millions of dollars in settlement. And I, I'm, I'm so glad that you see it that way. I had to pull up because I, I, I was going to um, quote the wrong name. Um, Toronto Burke uh, actually is the one who kind of coined the phrase in the movement that is Me Too movement in 2006. Mm-hmm. And I think that this, it took 10 years, I believe 2017 is when this kind of all started to occur. And I do think that that's interesting that you point out the those, you know, those cons of the, you know, of this phenomenon that occurred is that it it, it glamorized it. 
it, it made it, it it made it into this pedestalized movement that people were speaking to speaking to in this way that they almost made it into something that wasn't in a real like like it wasn't only happening in the real world like it was happening just to these celebrities let's feel for them let's support them in this situation and then that's when it started to unravel that this movement in itself did not was not started by these celebrities it was actually started by a woman who's been doing the work for so many years prior to um and and, and it's right in line like the the principles and the, and she's dead like the, the victims of those scenarios with those you know, very high profile people certainly are, you know, should be under that umbrella of Me Too movement, but we can't allow for it to be like this. Uh, we can't allow for it to be bastardized into a way where it's like now it's something else. Now it's completely something else. And now people are speaking about it wrapped up into this real anti-feministic type of thing. And to me, it's like, man, like this is like because I, I, I really thought it was um, I, I think I had that same initial reaction, too. Is that, oh, this is a good thing. You know, the empires are starting to fall. You know, something is about to start happening. And like all in the same time, you have Bill Cosby case going on. You have Harvey Weinstein, survivors, all these various people who've been involved with him coming out. And then also amidst all this, you have Trump, the president coming out. And it's like, it's just like, there's so much going on. All these various things, all these various cases, all these various allegations. Um, And I think that that's what I would love to, you know, speak to you to, um, I I would say, I guess my last two questions would be, there was a real interesting thing that I noticed, uh, um, you know, post, you know, kind of the rebranding of the Me Too movement was there was definitely a lot more, um, a lot more allegations that started to come about. uh, There has been a lot more that have been publicized, I would say more than anything. Um, And it still has that celebrity element to it. Um, I, I think that I've seen, you know, several moments in the past few years of, you know, hashtags being created via Twitter and Facebook where so many people are just telling their stories. Um, they may not be revealing who who those people might might have been, but they're telling their stories in some way, shape or form, um, which I think is, you know, I, I support it in whatever way that I can, you know, either by way of like just, you know, just asking what what roles can we play or what in what way in what space can somebody like myself who wants to be an advocate of these types of works? What exactly would you need from from me? And I think it's always hard to answer that question, but I, I would love to know exactly like this. I think that there's a level in degrees in terms of like sexual misconduct in all these various ways. And I think that for at a, at a time and it was it was definitely a point in time where it was all kind of handled in the exact same way. And I think that that was the issue or the trouble that a lot of people I've seen having. I've seen a lot of men reacting to it like, hold on, so we're going to get in trouble if we do this thing? Like, I ain't even, you know, I'm not even, quote unquote, I didn't even see that as an assault. I'm just, you know, I thought that was just a weird night. Maybe I just, I did too much. And now I'm going to be, I'm going to be punished for that thing. I'm going to be, you know, lose all these things. That was the reaction. And I didn't think too much of it until I started to see just more people in general speak to it like, dang, we really are going to, you know, bring this person's whole world down for this specific thing that isn't like this other thing that we all agree is terrible. So have you noticed that in terms of like this, like degree of sexual misconduct all the way to the point of, you know, a pattern of assault? Absolutely. And I think, again, like you're saying, there's different types of or different degrees of sexual misconduct. And I think that in some ways, hashtag me too leaves men feeling paranoid, almost like if they this or if they that, are they going to be lumped into a ha- the category of a, of a rapist? Because there is a big difference between an act of misconduct and sexual assault. And mm-hmm. I think that that's something that still needs more attention. And I think, you know, hashtag me too, things became very black and white. Mm-hmm. And that is, it's a problem for men and women because women also have expectations of themselves and the people that they're with. So they too may be mis sort of like misunderstanding what is going on in the moment and immediately jumping to, well, then that person assaulted me versus, but it's not that, it's not always that black and white. So I think it's something that, again, needs more focus and and like conversations and educating 
about, I don't think it should just be about let's come forward and say me too. I think it's about how do we help people understand what consent means? Mm -hmm. Um, Like I was just talking to an advocate the other day. That's all of what her work is about. It's about consent. And what is consent? Consent is not just yes or no. There's Mm -hmm. different levels of consent. There's different ways you can communicate with the, the person you're involved with to let them know what you think and what you feel in that situation. And it's not something that should be only put on men or women. It's, it's like, or two women together or two men together. I think it has to be about both people in that situation and being able to set boundaries and communicate about what is okay and what isn't. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's something that I think is pretty simple for me to understand on how to show up you know, in my own personal life. Um, I think for a lot of men, I think that there definitely needs to be this, um, this true, like stepping back of like, and understanding like what, what is okay and what's not okay. Mm -hmm. I think that um, the scenario that happened with, I believe Aziz Ansari, I think was a really, really interesting um, kind of, you know, case study of sorts that gave us this good example of like, this is what happens when you're just aggressive. You know, like you're doing too much. And like, as you see, this woman left that story and left that next day speaking to her friends and her friends are the ones who kind of let her like were really checking on her to be like, is that all that happened? Like, is that is that are you like, are you leaving anything out? Is that like because it sounds like, you know, he did things without your consent. And that and that's and that is exactly what that is. That is rape no matter way, what what way you want to, you know, kind of kind of say it i get it if it feels shameful to admit it because you you might feel like you allowed someone to harm you in this way but the fact of the matter the story that you're describing sounds so peculiar that that it it sounds like that's the lead up like you have the exact same lead up as so many women who've been through this experience and they can directly say that what what it is but i think for me what i took away with it was as 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 men who are in these particular, you know, kind of power dynamic positions, we have to be diligent in in terms of understanding and creating safe spaces. Like we have to be professionals at creating safety in every single way, in every single capacity, not only with our like physical behavior, but also with our words and our mindsets around things. Like if, if somebody feels uncomfortable, we have to adjust. We have to do something in that moment. We have to like not press on or make it their issue we got to do something. And I think for me, it's kind of like, I personally, uh, you know, take this, take these types of topics and things personal, not because of personal experience per se, but I got to live in this world. And it, and it, and it, and it truly like drives me, you know, insane to a point to have to continuously show and improve that I'm a safe man in every room that I go to. Cause it's like, I don't, I feel like I know, I know who I am. I, I've worked on myself. I know that I would never do these types of things, but to still have to like show and improve in every room that I'm in that, Hey, I'm not, I'm not one of those guys. I'm not this. I'm not that. I would never do this and that. I'm, I'm, I'm on the right side of this and my head is on straight. You know, I understand these things, but it's still, and I think that that's a big part of it because I know that a lot of men are in that same space as me, but don't even realize that they have that frustration. Um, I, I, I would say um, the idea of the celebrity ab- abuser is really interesting to me. Um, I did an episode uh, last year called uh, The Devil's Judicator, which I thought was somewhat a cheeky uh, <laughs> title of the episode. But I spoke it was speaking to the overall case with uh, with Sean Diddy Combs and Cassie. And I think that prior to that, I think we've had a multitude of celebrities that have, you know, been accused and there's been allegations, there have been cases that have been all the way came through and certain things have came to light. Um, the, the, the actual, you know, you, you being involved or being a witness and a participant in the uh, R. Kelly trial um, and that being something that still is seen as this almost like prime example of why we need to genuinely change how we approach some of these things um, because of this, the, you know, the it's still probably people we still don't know who were affected by his, you know, his his reign of abuse. Um, what do you think about how we exist and how we handle these things? Uh, you know, as as people who are consumers of music, consumers of movies and various things that these people who are celebrities do. 
I feel like that's what it seems like a lot of people are forever dealing with on the day to day, too. It's like, oh, so we've learned who these people are. Can we still listen to their music? Should we be doing this? Are we actually in, in providing in quote unquote still doing these things? Are we actually promoting and supporting the idea of what their, their bad behavior is, even if we can quote unquote separate the, the art from the artist? I think that's a big conflict, and it's it's a conversation that comes up here in my house with my almost thirteen year old. Um, I think it it brings up a lot of feelings for people about well, if I know this about this person now, and then I still choose to listen to his music, does that mean I'm condoning these acts that he's accused of? Yeah. I don't think that's the case. Yeah. Um, it came up in my car in a carpool one week when we were driving to soccer. They were talking about Kanye. Oh. And, I love his music and my kid has his music on his playlist. Yeah. Um, but my kid and the kid in the back seat were arguing about why he shouldn't be listening to his music anymore. Mm -hmm. And again, what my kid was saying was, I don't think what he says is good. I don't think it's, you know, we are Jewish. He's Jewish. And he says, I don't really care. I mean, he said, what does he say? He says, I don't think it's right that he says these things and he was saying how he didn't think his apology was genuine, which, you know, I would, I would, I agree with him. I think it was scripted and somebody wrote it and he read it, but he said, but I really like his music and um, I don't want to not listen to his music. That doesn't mean that I think that he's a good person or that he's doing good things. Mm -hmm. I think that's something a lot of people struggle with. I can understand if you're someone who, you know, if, if you're one of his advertisers and you decide to pull back because you don't want your, you don't want uh, R. Kelly associated with your product, For sure. that makes sense to me. But, you know, some of these people, just like most abusers, they're not all bad. They have talent, some of them. They may have some good qualities. So I think you have to just be mindful about the way you think about it. And it's really everybody's own opinion. If you said to me, I would never listen to his music again, I wouldn't say to you, well, why would you say that? I would respect that. But I mm -hmm. think that there's a lot of confusion and conflict about it. And I think people, they just don't know what to do. They feel yeah. guilty if they do support the artist, but then they feel like mad when they choose not to listen to the music because they like the music. Mm. And, you know, but I think, because as you were, as you were, you know, speaking on that, I appreciate that antidote. I think that for me, I got to a place to where I realized that the root of it isn't doesn't start at celebrity. Mm -hmm. And bear with me, I, I genuinely feel like there if there's been particular acts that have occurred from people with high in high places with a lot of power, and we still have to either support or engage with these individuals. Um, i.e., if you are a you know a manufacturer, you work in a manufacturer's plant. And you find out that the CEO of this company or whatever, of the, one of the products that you might make on a daily basis, this is how you feed your family, comes out that they are a part of the clan. It's something crazy. Are you going to leave that job that day? Possibly not. Right. Because that, that, that would genuinely shake up your world, especially in today's job market, you know? So so you might not make that. It's, it's a deep confliction that I think that the that so much of the American society has kind of put us in to where it's like, we've already, we've already kind of, we already signed, we already signed up for it. We've already typed in the, you know, accepted the terms and conditions of being Americans and being in this country. So having people who are, have a lot of power, have a lot of influence, but also do a lot of bad things. It's kind of the, the landscape or the foundation that we've already accepted. And so I think that that's why that phenomenon is such one is, is one that, kind of keeps coming up yep. um and and i but i do think that there are um ways in which that we can you know continuously work to try to handle those things because to me i do believe that there is a there's a confliction with the consumer but i think in terms of corporations there is a uh, a, a level of dissonance that they have mm -hmm. because I, I believe that when they choose to as in corporations and various things when they choose to strip away these opportunities, strip away and cancel these deals and contracts, it does affect people. Right. It does actually make people be like, oh, well, I guess I should stop listening. If if they if they took this money, if this, it must be really damning, this evidence or this or what they said must really be that bad. But also to it also creates this like divisive 
thing as well, where it's like, oh, they really going to do Kanye? Well, I ain't wearing Adidas no more. Mm-hmm. Like, because they, they already, they, they already aren't there. They're loyal to the thing they're already loyal to. And, they, and it's easy for them to let this go, but keep this other thing. But it's like, look at, look at what you're lifting up no matter what. Right. Like either either example really isn't the best <laughs> like to sit here and support a, co- a company that's making billions of dollars really don't need you to to cape for them. But also to somebody who has clocked over a billion dollars in making music and his deals also doesn't need your advocacy either. Mm-hmm. So it's like this real interesting we need to support the, the, the wealth class to a certain degree when in reality it's like we aren't even giving that much intensity of support on the ground level. Yeah, we're and I think that that's always the thing that always seems to bother me because I think because of that phenomenon, it creates that same that echo within these you know internal family settings as well. Where it's like, of course, if R. Kelly can do be be a predator for decades, I lived in Chicago, and I can say for sure, I can say with, with pure just firsthand anecdotes from different people that I spoke to. There are women who are mothers of children my age who both have stories about interactions they've had or people that they've known who've had interactions with this man. So he certainly was a pariah amongst the community. <laughs> it's no it's no question of the thing. And 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 but yet still there's still some type of space that people create for people who might show up in those similar ways in their internal families. So to me, it feels like there has to be some type of ostracizing. There has to be a, a deep slapping, slapping of the wrist in a genuine way that actually creates a reason for a reform to me. Because I don't think that you can really have reform and have people genuinely care about survivors of these things if we don't genuinely look at the people who do these bad things, no matter what they are, even, you know, outside of, you know, the, you know, these, these sexual misconduct and the sexual assault, but in general, like we're never doing anything about the people who cause harm in any way, shape or form. Then that, then that's, what's going to keep allowing everything to happen. I don't know if you feel that way, but I really, that's what I've eventually gotten to. Mm-hmm. No, I definitely agree. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a trip. It's a trip. Um, I feel like we did a thing. We've talked so much. I would love for you to not only um, tell people where they can, you know, support you, um, support you and, 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 and also get help. I think I do. I do a thing. Uh, my last segment is always called Ascending On. It's my call to action segment. And so I would love for you to, you know, just share any resources. You know, this is a great time, you know, if you plug the book <laughs> and uh, and for you to just let people know how they could possibly get some aid if they need aid in this situation. So I think if, if there, there's somebody out here listening that is currently in a situation where they're experiencing any type of abuse, the best organization to reach out to would be RAIN. So that's www.rainn.org. Um, there's also the National Child Abuse Helpline. I don't have that phone number, but if you Google that, you will be able to easily get the phone number. If people are out here and they're struggling with things like depression or PTSD because of something that happened to them, there is 988, which you can text or call, and they have counselors there around the clock. Um, if people want to get in touch with me, they can find me at my on my website, www.cherrybotwin.com. Of course, I'm on social media. So my my Instagram, I'm Warrior Botwin7. You can find me on Facebook, Sherry LCSW, um, and I'm on LinkedIn. Um, my next book, my third book, is going to be coming out in three months, Stolen Childhoods. You can pre-order it now on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles. If you want a discount code, if you want to get 30% off, all you need to do is go to my website and there's a discount code that people can use so you can get 30% off the pre-order. And those books actually are shipping out on April 2nd. Mm. So soon. You so good at this. That was good. That was good. I had. I was like, let me tell all this stuff. I do not want to. I do not want to miss a thing. <laughs> I appreciate you so much, Shari, for giving me your time. Um, shout out to uh, shout out to uh, to our girl Rena 
Uh, Rena Freeman and oh, Watts right. is what I, yeah, I, right. yeah, yeah, that, that's what I like to call her, Rena Freeman and Watts. <laughs> and so I, I appreciate her for connecting you, uh, connecting us because she was certainly a person who just seen that episode, the Devil's Judicated episode, and was like, I think you need to talk to Shari. You need to talk to her. And so I love those types of things that happen, you know. Um, But I I appreciate you for coming and giving me anything of your voice and your expertise so much. Um, It's definitely um, things like this I know are going to always help people and give people just that, you know, extra layer of resource for whenever they hear this. That's why I love podcasting, because no matter if you hear it when this comes out or Mm -hmm. whenever those the, the the conversation that we have or that we have is such an evergreen conversation. Um, so I thank you so much. I thank you oh, so much for that. Thank you. Oh yes, and I yes. I look forward to listening to the episode. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. But no, this has been the Soulfully Conscious Podcast and Humans Simply Being Humans. I've been Rodney Perry. Make sure that you follow me on all things at Kings underscore memoirs. Follow the podcast at Simply King Pod, and make sure that you. Also tap in with with Shari. All of the things that she mentioned and the send it on are going to be in the description of this episode. So make sure y'all tap in, tap in, tap in. Like I said before, this has been the Soulfully Conscious Podcast for Humans Simply Being Humans. I've been Rodney Perry. This has been Shari Bodwin. And this has been Simply King. Peace.